Good morning and welcome to the Ask Weldon Show, episode 150. It is a big day, you guys. I started the show back in 2014, I want to say, maybe 2013, maybe 2015, somewhere along the, line, the lines of 2014, I think. We'll go with the median. And uh, and I guess I took, I took a pretty long break when I was really intensely coaching for TSM and G2. I don't think that I pumped out a lot of shows, but here we are. We're back on the train. We're back on the roller coaster and we're up to episode 150. So 150 shows into this mega, mega endeavor that I'm doing. And today we're going to talk about offensive co and defensive coordinators in pro League of Legends. So the, the kind of like a coaching role from traditional NFL e, NFL sport. I almost said NFL eSport. NFL sport. I don't know if they have them in football as well. Um, it's kind of a different kind of thing. The coaching business. So how do you communicate your coaching business? Communicate meaning, you know, marketing and things like that. Um, how do you transition from laning phase if you're doing well, if you want to carry without overreaching? And what is a good practice routine to avoid burnout? That is the show today. My name is Weldon and I am a sports psychologist. Sports. Holy cow. I'm not a sports psychologist. I just slipped out because I am so tired. It's 6.30 a.m., which normally I stream two hours ago. I stream at 4.30 a.m. Uh, in Helsinki time. So, because I, I stream for you guys in North America, of course, obviously. But uh, but it's not it's not working out so well today. I had a little bit of insomnia last night, and um, so I was, I was up too late, unfortunately. Didn't get to bed on time, and so here I am a little bit late. But anyway... I'm a sports psychology trainer. I'm an esports psychology trainer. I'm an esports coach. And usually the questions that people ask me are related to sports psychology or esports coaching or esports training or learning, things like that, or League of Legends, usually. But feel free to go to Twitter and use the hashtag AskWeldon to get your question on the show. Alternatively, you can go to Discord, my Discord, linked down below, and you can call in your question. I have I, I prefer call in questions. So if you call in your in your question, I will get to it 100% it will be on the show no questions I have tons of Twitter questions that kind of stockpile up because that's the preferred method people like to type but if you do an audio question it will get on the show which is very exciting for you I'm sure and then uh, and then there's instructions in the discord how to go to the ask Weldon show channel and and record into the ask Weldon show channel bot Craig and then to drop it in there so you can do that all right let's jump into the show So the first question is today from Raven Law, and this is way back in December of 2016. And Raven Law asks, what do I do when I seem to do well in lane, but I can't transition it to after laning? How do I push a lead without overextending? Okay, so this is a, I wanted to kick off with an in-game question, kind of a deal with, deal with something related to lead, because the next three questions, we jump out of the game, we talk about business or coaching or professional training in some regard. So... I think actually that, actually that, so if you do well in laning and your team is doing well, it's kind of hard to screw up, right? So if you're doing well and your team's doing well, then you just kind of like play a safe, normal game and you just continue to snowball your lead and you and you usually have victory. The, the question that Ravenlaw is asking seems tinged more like, what do I do when I do well in lane? But my team necessarily doesn't do that well, doesn't necessarily do that well across the map, and I'm going to need to exert my influence and my, my advantage on the map in order to win the game. And I think that this is more of a barrier question than a, than a how far should I, you know, what should I do question, because the real answer is that you're going to lose some of these games where you get an advantage and you can't carry your team hard enough. And you're going to get unlucky in some of them as well. But what you should do is you should play m with higher levels of risk than normal in order to reap more important rewards like winning the game, right? So you cannot play a standard game. That's the one thing you cannot do. You can't, if your team is in the deficit and they're they're kind of uh, in the lead somewhere else and you have put your lane opponent in a hole, then you can't necessarily just hope that it equals out because positions and duties across the team composition are different. You're probably going to have to play a little bit riskier, unless you're playing some sort of like OP team fighting champ, that, like Caitlyn. You probably don't need to play that much riskier with Caitlyn to carry a game if you're super, super fed. But anyway, um, 
Yeah, so so you're going to have to play riskier, right? You're going to make a riskier play. But that, of course, entails the fact that you're going to be uh, losing more and more of these risks. And so what you need to do is, is develop a tolerance for risking the game or risking losing in order to win the game. The worst, worst thing you can do is not risk anything and lose the game slowly and just kind of like wither and die. Because what you're basically doing is you're waiting for your opponent to mess up. And that is, let me tell you, not a very good and productive way to play League of Legends at any level. Um, of course, if you want to win the world championships, that's what you should do. That's what Samsung did. They just basically waited for their they waited for their opponent to mess up, and they never did. So that's one way to play. I guess it wins you a world title. But prior to becoming a, a world championship team, one of the best ways to play the game is proactive, meaning that you are the one who is learning the skills, exerting your influence on the map, and trying to strive to... to to understand the limits of your play and to push the limits of your play up until you get to the peak. If you kind of like play passively and wait for your opponent to make a mistake, you are not pushing the limits of your own play. So this is advice not just for winning the game, but also for developing your skills. Uh, essentially, you want to take a little bit more risk on and you want to agree to take that risk on in order to actually hone skills that you do not already have. Because then maybe in like four weeks, the play that you're attempting that's a risky play will not be a risky play anymore because you'll be so much better at doing it because you tried to strive to do it a couple times. So how do you transition from laning? Uh, specifically, you want to take down... Nowadays, you want to make sure that you take down your tower and then you want to um, push the wave all the way to the tier two. This is a little bit risky, but you want to try to push the wave all the way to the tier two. You want to clear the next wave in their face at the tier two and then you want to base for an item, preferably, and you want to come out from lane like essentially to another lane and it'd be great if you could prep that person too if you could say hey i'm going to come out in two minion waves i'm going to like i'm going to clear the next wave base and come to your lane mr top laner or mr mid laner and they will start protecting the minion wave they'll start stacking a wave which means that instead of aggressively pushing and then being free they'll try to trade their opponent off of the wave and they'll try to last hit their own minions uh, or the opposing minions to in order to uh, you know, keep as many alive as they can on their side. And so, and then, so then when you're, when the next wave comes, there'll be, you know, maybe eight minions instead of five, and you can siege the turret with the fact that you are there and your lane opponent is back in their own lane. So that is the number one way to transition from a laning phase. After that, you want to make sure that you are in the, uh, usually you want to make sure that you are not in the safe lane. So you don't want to just go to a safe lane and farm. You want to be in the place where the plays aren't being made. So you essentially, wherever you are, that's the playmaking zone. Um, and so if you want a play to happen, you have to go there. And then if you want one of your teammates who's behind to catch up, tell them to go to the safe lane to catch, okay? So for example, you go to the top lane after you make after you make the play bot and you push on the turret and you guys are hitting the turret and you tell the top laner, quick, recall, go bottom and catch the wave because it's been stacking up for the last two minutes. Now you can just go there and you can sit at our tier one and you can catch it. You get all the minions, and they're, they're not going to dive you or anything, probably, because it's solo queue. So you can you can stay where the play is active, and you can send your deficit person to, like, go catch the lane and then come back to you. That's I mean, that's, that's the transition. So specifically, there's a lot more things you do after that, but the transition is a pretty fun part. If you can nail that, you can really blast a game open in five seconds. Okay, thank you for that question. Let's jump into question number two, which is an audio question. What do you think about pro teams going to having things like offensive and defensive coordinators similar to like football in terms of actually having maybe like playbook style um, combinations with different team comps to where teams could actually habituate what kind of plays they wanted to make with different champions so they kind of knew what after a while since it's a habit they would know hey like hey i have this item spike we can we can do this we can call this play and we, they've done it like a thousand times at that point so it'd be super easy what do you think about going that direction in the pro scene okay ryan thanks for the question so there's a number of barriers related to the suggestion that you made first of all offensive defensive coordinators make sense when you have an offensive team and a defensive team um but but we don't have one so uh, it's like football as in european football where you just have a coach for the whole field, you know, uh, and and then the other the other issue is so so I assume basically you're talking about like maybe coaches for different team comps or coaches for different plays, you know, or something like that. 
so that you have you know certain team comps that are related to this and you have a coach who's generating plays for those kind of team comps and you have another team comp coach for other stuff maybe the issue is there's too many team comps there's not enough like uh you uh, solidarity there uh, I, I think that literally even though we scrimmed you know more than 30 games in a week we we still you still never end up usually with the team comp that you are going to play against the team t- team comp that you're going to play against ever uh, because because one champion here might change or one champion there might change there's just there's so many champions in league of legends and there's so many different variations of the draft that it's almost impossible to predict what you're going to play the the other main problem is there's no way to drill like what you're talking about would be great if Riot would create a tool that would allow us to drill the game, but unfortunately we don't have one. And so it's currently possible to run iterations of a certain moment or a certain play and have a thousand, uh, thousand attempts at a certain thing. Um, the reason being because we train in such a bizarre way by training against our opponents and we train using full scrimmage games that you have a lot of different things you're trying to train in the game. Some people want to play a certain champion. You have to train a comp to get the skirmishing of the comp down. Um, You want to train maybe, you know, how to take Baron and stuff like that. Um, You want to train, some people want to train the 2v2 against the opposing 2v2. So they're trying to force a certain matchup in the bot lane, trying to force their opponents to draft a certain way so that they can practice the laning against them, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, there's so many different variables in the training of what you want to get done in a week. And it's so messed up right now with how it is that you're training against opponents that it's impossible to plan and to coordinate at that level so it will only happen when there are academy teams that are as good as the number two team in the league because the number one team in the league has a massive benefit training against the number two team in the league and they are not going to train against their academy team as long as their academy team is like number 12 or number 14 in the league in terms of skill level right because there's no point they could be training against number two and they could be getting better at league instead of training against the number 14 team, their academy team, and making the academy team better, okay? So there's this tension there that's basically never going to be resolved unless there is saved, kind of saved state games, or unless teams start recruiting 10-man rosters for the starting roles, not for the academy teams. So yeah, that's uh, that, those are the issues with your suggestion that make it so that it's basically impossible and not likely to happen in the next bunch of years all right that was quick so we can go on to the third question third question is also from twitter and it's vijay c and they ask what's a good practice routine to avoid burnout i'm asking for academic competitions first of all thanks for the question sorry it took so long to get to it i think a year and a couple months is a is quite a long wait and A good practice routine to avoid burnout. So this is a very personal question. You have to measure your burnout because people burn out at different times for different volumes of training and different intensities of training. So essentially what you should do is you should go to your, the the first thing you should do is go to your phone and you have a free sleep tracker there. You can download the sleep tracking app. You can stick your phone on your mattress with you. Um, Although that's kind of a bad thing because then you're liable to use it, which will will disrupt your sleep, which is kind of lame. So you could also get some sort of sleep tracking watch. Uh, but really, the, one of the best things to do is get an MFIT QS. If you just go search Google for E-M-F-I-T QS, MFIT QS, you'll find one of the best sleep trackers out there. There's similar ones like Bedit, B-E-D-D-E-T-I-T, I think, um, that kind of adopted a similar style of technology. But they were basically non-invasive and they listen. So they, they just hear everything that's going on. Um, one of the most accurate kind that you can get is an actual heart rate monitor that you put on yourself like a bodyguard from first beat or something like that. And you diagnose your sleep by listening, by essentially tracking your heart rate rhythms, not your heart rate, your heart rate rhythm, your heart rate variability. And then you know how close you are to burnout. And then you know that you can train more, you train less. Um, it's very unlikely that you are going to train yourself to burnout. If you're an amateur, like burnout usually entails six plus hours a day of training. Um, you can burn out on life. So you can be doing too many different things and you can be burned out just from stress in general, from like school and social obligations and et cetera. And then league pushes you over the edge, right? But it's very rare to burn out on league or gym training or something like that just from doing gym training or league um, because 
I mean, look at pro athletes, they're going to be doing two or three or four times per, as much daily as you and they're not burning out because they're cutting everything else out of their life so that they don't have, you know, accumulation of stress on, on other facets of their living. So I would say uh, it's it's really hard to adjust a practice routine in, to, in order to avoid burnout. You really have to adjust life in order to avoid burnout. And for that, you need to track your burnout because I don't know what it's at. And then thirdly, the thing you can do to increase your coping ability is, of course, try my Mac program. So meditation and um, stress relief basically kind of come hand in hand. Mindfulness is one of the best ways to increase your battery, I would say. I would have the players, when they had a bad night of sleep and they were on the hook for two blocks, I would literally have the players meditate between blocks. They would like, we'd have lunch, then they, then the player that was at risk of burnout would go meditate so that they could focus better in the second block. So they could increase their battery or their mana pool or whatever it is you want to call it. And then they had more to expend throughout the day. I typically use meditation like in timing when I would drink coffee. So I would go in the morning, I would wake up, I'd use my two hours of productive, you know, stimulus from the waking up chemicals that you get in your body when you wake up. Then I would meditate instead of drinking coffee, I would meditate and I get another good two hours of productivity. And then I would drink my coffee. And then I would get another two hours of productivity. So I'd have a six solid hours of insane productivity in the morning, which for me was really fantastic. It was like a whole half a year that I was doing that uh, really consistently. And I was able to accomplish a lot of things in my business and in my life and in my parenting and in my self-improvement and everything. So you can try something like that. Um, mindfulness is fine by itself. You can use any mindfulness app. In my program, the mindfulness is combined with a kind of a lecture series around cognitive behavioral th therapy called acceptance commitment therapy so act and it's um it's basically a kind of protocol re related to helping you discipline your actions based on the values that you hold true to so that you can accept your emotions and accept your emotional state and then move forward with, with what you really want in the long run even if you don't feel super motivated to do the, the things that get you there in the first place like disciplining yourself to do something or to not do something that you that you don't uh, in order to achieve your goals essentially so that's what i do with mac it's like a goal achieving program combined with uh, mindfulness and meditation because i think that you need that extra battery if you're gonna if you're gonna apply it towards discipline and usually if you have a discipline moment that you want to do like go to the gym if you meditate first you can force yourself to do it because you can really you know increase your battery and then go so yeah that is uh that is the answer to that question Okay, let's go to the last question of the show. How to go about communicating for a coaching business? It's an audio question, and it's from F. I'm not sure who that is. Um, reminder before I go, again, about the Mac program, you can use the code ASKWELDON, A-S-K-W-E-L-D-O-N, and the link is down below, and you can get a $5 discount. So I sell it. And right now I'm in the midst of developing the actual app, like a, like a phone app kind of thing for it. Um, I'm not developing it. I'm just hiring people to develop it. But I'm using all of the sales from this program. 100% go to that project because it's kind of a side project from, from me, right? I need, unfortunately, I need to use most of the money that I make in my life to support the family because I have three going on four kids. Um, but this, the, the sales from this program, they aren't going to support me. They're going to support this channel so I use it to like pay for audio mastering for for this YouTube show, and then and then they and then right after that, which is only like eight dollars a month, and then the, after that, because I use a program, uh, and then after that, they go to developing the the app, which is coming up. I just uh, purchased wireframes. Then now I'm just purchasing a little bit of uh, art, software architecting, and we just founded the, the company. So things are progressing on that. So thank you for those of you who have purchased the program for supporting that. It's really fantastic to see it coming together. And thank you if you decide to go purchase it. Remember, there's a 100% guarantee, meaning it's not going to work 100%, but 100% guarantee you're going to be satisfied with it or else just message me and I'll give you a refund because um, like I said, I'm not using it to buy bread. I'm using it to buy programming skills. Also, if you happen to be a Ionic or a... Um, Firebase or a AWS Lamba like kind of programmer or architect, please message me and you want to help out. Okay, anyway, going to the last question. Hi, well done. Hi, chat. I wanted to ask um, how would you go about communication 
for a coaching business because I would like to do it for the French audience, I mean French speaking audience. The thing is we don't have a main platform like Reddit where you can just get noticed and just pop off in terms of views and have this really big starting buzz, you know. Um, also, I was number one, now I'm only low diamond. Do you think it's enough or should I improve in zero Q to have sort of a proof per se of my ability, even though I plan to release public coaching by videos uh, just to show what I can do? Thank you. Okay, thank you for the awesome question and the amazing accent. I love French accents. I don't know why. French and UK accents just sound so cool. So um, first, let me answer the rank question. If you can do both, you should do both. If you can rank up and also do all the other stuff you need to do and balance your life, then you should rank up and you should also focus on your coaching and you should do both because high rank will never, ever, ever hurt you when you're trying to develop a coaching career. And the higher rank, the better. It shows that you can coach yourself which is a very important capability. Okay, then the second thing is how to communicate uh, your coaching business, how to market your coaching business without Reddit, essentially. So um, this is a pretty straightforward thing. There is a community somewhere. Okay, so you have to find that community. Essentially, the first place you should look is places where people can talk freely. So that would be Facebook groups, probably a really, really big community within Facebook if you can't find Reddit. Thank you, camera, for dying just at the worst possible expression. I was literally like closing my eyes to make a very excited face. Sorry, YouTube and Twitch. I'm going to change my battery real quick. Continue the question. We're not going to turn this out of YouTube, just FYI. Um, hello? Camera? Camera? How come the uh, how come the battery didn't work? Wow, maybe I do have to trim this out of YouTube. All right, I'm gonna add my webcam here. Video capture device. Uh, create new webcam. Hey guys. All right, where were we? How come that seems unfocused to me? What do you think, everybody? Uh, Logitech webcam. Here we go. Webcam settings. Um, default. Advanced. Why does it seem so... I guess my other camera is just amazing. Right? No. Huh. Oh, well. Anyway. Oh, hi. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Okay. So uh, quick, quick switch of cameras there. Because uh, my other one, like, even though I have two batteries and I just put in the other battery, for some reason, it's not turning back on. I don't know what the deal is. So moving back into the question, how do you communicate your coaching business when you don't have Reddit? Um, so it's true that I used Reddit to pop off. And the first place that you should look for communities is anywhere that there are social message boards. So you can try traditional forums, try to find big forums. You can try to find Facebook groups, which is probably the case, I would guess. Facebook groups are, are massive in Brazil, for example, as far as the League of Legends community. Um, you can try to find, you know, French Reddit style sites uh, that, that are kind of like Reddit, but are French. Uh, so those are the free communication areas where you can exchange, you can basically go in and talk and you should join every single conversation that you can about, about your expertise and you should try to contribute value in the conversation. Say like, hey, try this, hey, try this. Okay. The second thing that you can do and that you should do is you should look for communi communities that are, that are gated, right? That are not free contributions. So you can't just like, for example, YouTube is a community where you can contribute and you can join in, but you can't really have a big voice because it's based on followership. You start at the bottom in those communities and you start collaborating with people who are like at your level and a little above. So you find the person who has 150 subscribers on YouTube and you go on their show, on their talk show. Then you find the talk show that has uh, 2K subscribers and you go on their talk show. Then you find the podcast or the talk show that has, you know, 5K and you go on their talk show. And every time you go on the talk show, you, you on your website, you create links of this. You're like, okay, here's the talk show I was on last week. Okay, here's the talk show I was on this week. Here's the talk show I'm going on next week. And you use that to build up your brand and get invites. 
So then you show you send that website to the next talk show. Say, hey, I'd love to be a guest on your show. Here's the shows I've been on. Um, you know, I I don't have a lot of followers on Twitter yet, but but I contribute a ton to the talk shows I'm on. I'd love to be a guest on your show. Uh, I will also pay you fifty dollars to be a guest on your show. Wink, wink. Um, you know, like these are the things that you can do to get to, to be a guest on a on a YouTube show or a streamer stream or something where you are essentially building up your brand, like uh, in these closed communities, not closed communities, but communities where you have to pay your dues and grind up the followership to have a voice. Then the, the third thing you can do is you can do coaching on an open platform. So find a, co- a website like leaguecoaching.gg. Uh, I think School One or Egg School or something is another is another place like that. And you can um, you can essentially like start building up your coaching brand by streaming these coaching sessions and doing the LS as in the the Korean American. I think he might be American. I'm not sure if he's Korean, but anyway, LS Nick, the the online uh, coach who streams a lot of his training. So one of the best things you can do is stream training and then cut out clips from it and and you know say share those clips in the Facebook communities or on YouTube where you're teaching a specific thing. And you're not going to have a traffic generator like Reddit to kind of push it in a subculture, in a subgroup like Summoner School. But what you should do is try to find the version of that that exists in, in the French audience. And unfortunately, if there's no Reddit or open community on Facebook or something like that, which I, I highly doubt that's the case. I bet that there's Facebook groups that have massive following or some sort of forum where these things are discussed. Then you're stuck with the, with the content grind, which means you need to create content and then you need to go on other people's shows and show up in content from people who have bigger audiences and you need to steal their audience. That's my recommendation. And thank you for coming to the show today, everybody. Appreciate the attendance and uh, I will see you all next time. Make sure to check out the Mac program. I can't actually switch scenes now because when I switch scenes, look what happens. That happens. Uh, but I'm about to go to the gym right now so you can catch me on my Instagram at the gym. Yesterday, I went and had a massive day of pec and tri workout, chest and yeah, chest and arm workout, and it was brutal. And uh, my back is still sore from my back day. So today is leg day. Today is an insane, insanely painful leg day coming up. I'm going to try to make it so, so hard that I actually cannot sit down on the toilet tomorrow. That's the goal is to make it so that when I sit down, I cry. That's how much I want it to hurt. I was not able to do that last week because I ran out of time on my leg day. Darn. But maybe today, maybe today I can push my leg day to the point of, of agony in the morning. We shall see. Well then, out.